All right, good evening. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We appreciate it. Um, the first thing I want to do is uh, just go over what we have in this. Uh, it's called an IFAC, ind Individual Field... Uh, it's a field medical kit, anyway. Um, you, this is by Everlit. You can get these anywhere from $29 to $150 online through the Everlit uh, website or on... Uh, Amazon, you know, whatever. And then you can also just supplement into the kit for whatever you need. So I'll just go over some of the things that we have in here. One of the, the um, important things in here is the uh, combat uh, tourniquet. And I'll pass that around, actually. But if you have a, a bleeder that won't stop with pressure, if you have, uh, like somebody gets a cut or uh, is stabbed or shot or whatever, um, if you can't just hold pressure on that and stop the bleeding, you'll need to apply the tourniquet. If, if it's down below, you wanna put it above the site of the bleed so it's closest to the heart. And this little spindle here, you just tighten it up and usually tighten it up until they scream and then spin one more time. Is it tighter than a blood pressure cuff? Yes. Yes. Yeah, because you're trying to stop the bleeding. Okay. Um, if you have a chance, if you have a marker, you can mark the time that you put the, put the tourniquet on. You should, should not leave it on any longer than two hours in a normal circumstance. Um, if, you, uh, if it's an arterial bleed and you're out in the boondocks, you just need to leave it on for as long as you want to keep the person alive, obviously. Um, that's, that's the main thing. Sir? Do you know if they uh, still suggest loosening it for, you know, you used to say like every... Every two every hours, yeah. Loosen yep. it and then tighten it back up. Yep, yep. Yeah, they still do that. They recommend two hours for it to be, to be on. And then at the two-hour mark, you want to release it, let blood flow back through the arm to get the veins to fill back up with oxygenated blood and then you turn, retighten it and then remark the new time that you put. Mark each time. Correct, you have right. to mark each time. Jeez. So each time you, when you first put it on, you put your time. Two hours, obviously in two hours, you're either gonna be at a hospital or somewhere where you can get medical attention for stitches or sutures or what have you. Worst case scenario, if you don't, like you said, two hours, loosen it for a few minutes, retighten it, retime it. Right. Can you repeat the questions that you're asked so we can hear it? Sure. Um, yeah, like you said, the, the main thing is, is to keep the person alive. If, if it's a really bad bleed, um, it's better to lose an arm because of the tourniquet than to lose their life because we used to say in the medical field, all bleeding stops. Yeah. Sooner or later, all bleeding stops. So you wanna make sure that um, you either stop it or you keep the patient alive, okay? <laughs> After we had a little um, incident at the gun range, I had to make a, little, a few changes in <laughs> some of the uh, things that I had in we my kit. Names. We won't mention any names, but I just added some two by two sterile gauze pads, you roll them up and just apply pressure on whatever needs to be done. <laughs> I've got some three by threes as well. I've also got uh, added some stuff is called uh, dermoplast and it is a, a three in one medicated first aid cloth. So you could just wipe, wipe the area clean. So minimize the chance of infection. One of the other things that came with the kit is this aluminum splint, and you can cut it down to as, as uh, short as you need it. If you know they, they just broke a finger, you just cut a little piece of it off, and it's got a little rubber uh, coating on it so that it doesn't tear up the skin. And you can just fold it to you know whatever shape, whatever shape you need. And that, yeah, that's like that, yeah. yeah, you can cut it. Yes. Yeah. 
there we go. And then you just wrap, wrap a, uh, a gauze bandage around it to hold it in place. So you get to where you're going. Also with cut, you don't have, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Gauze, or you don't have anything. You, are, you have, and this is going to sound weird, but cayenne pepper. Take cayenne pepper and push it into the cut. You're going to scream, <laughs> obviously, but it's going to stop the bleeding also. It acts as a coagulant. So just if you think about it, if you're in the kitchen and you do, you cut your finger or what have you, and you're, what do I do? Because I've done it washing dishes, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. One other quick bathroom. There's a guy in a bar fight, and he, uh, of course, they cut over his eye like that. He took salt. Yeah. Stuffed it with salt. Kind of bruising thing. And didn't even scar much. That'll work. Another thing that I added in here is a pair, pair of uh, non-sterile rubber gloves. They're not for keeping the wound sterile or anything like that, but you don't want to, you know, like if we're out at the range shooting and something happens, you don't want to introduce any bacteria from your hands into the, into the wound. So I just keep those in there and you can buy a box of those, a hundred for, I don't know, Five bucks, I don't know what they are, but yeah, not, not very much. And Bob was talking about the uh, cayenne pepper. They also sell this, this uh, stuff called quick clot, and it's a powder, or a bandage that's in a day with powder that you can just put over the, the site that will uh, stop the bleeding. Does it say what the powder is? The it does. It's on here somewhere, anyways. I was just going to say with homeopathic self salts, I don't know how many people are aware of homeopathy, but there's 12 cell salts. And there's a particular one that works as well as that powder or your cayenne pepper. You can take it internally, but you can also pack a wound. And it's just made with lactose sugar pills. And that's another thing that, that's a good point is there are so many things in nature all around us that we can gather up plants and, and things uh, to, yeah, yeah, to, to uh, help with, with these medical emergency type things. Another thing that we've got in, in this kit is a, uh, an emergency thermal blanket. It's really small, it's, it's you know, packaged light, and it will uh, keep your patient warm, uh, keep them from going into shock. I travel I grab the big bag so one of the things for you to uh, know when you are to gather together when you're putting together a, a kit for uh, SHTF is to make sure you you have all your medications whether it's aspirin uh, Tylenol Advil you know whatever that you use for a pain reliever um, if you have any uh, medications that you take on a daily basis for blood pressure or that kind of thing. Try to talk to your doctor into letting, and your insurance company into letting you have a 90 day supply instead of a 30 day supply. So that if something happens, um, you'll have your medications and you won't get, it, get into a hypertensive crisis, that kind of thing. And I've got all kinds of stuff in here. More sterile gauze pads. Where am I? 
Has anybody ever heard of a sucking chest wound? Okay. Um, one of the things uh, when you're around firearms uh, or if something happens that uh, you're in a situation where there's gunfire going back and forth, if somebody gets shot in the chest, um, their lungs are going to collapse. Okay. Um, your lung operates on, on pressure. And when the, uh, there's three lobes in the right side and two lobes on the left, and if you get shot, say, on the right side, because you've got a, you've got a hole in the chest now, air's going to go in there, and the lobes are going to shrink down. So now you've got all this free air in there. And what we used to do back, back when I was in the service in the mid-'70s is all our sea rations came with uh, cigarette packs. So we would save the cellophane from it. And if we needed it, you just put it down and you wrap, either tape it down or whatever to seal that hole up until you can get them to the, to the hospital or whatever. But now they have these chest, vented chest seals and it's got an adhesive back on it and it's got a valve on there. So you just place it over the hole in the chest and every time they take a breath, the free air that's in the chest is gonna come out and it's gonna seal that up over time. So it'll, it'll help get them, it'll cut down the time that, uh, you know, they're gonna be in trouble. It's a, 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 a vented chest seal. Is that in that entire first aid bag or this is your personal? This, this is something that I added. Yeah, and this is something I just got off Amazon. Yeah. Isn't there also, if you don't have one, there's a manual way Oh, yes, if you have, um, say you have a bag from your lunch meat, you know, a Ziploc bag or whatever, what you can do is you can put that over, take three sides, and then once the three sides are taped, tell them to take a deep breath in, and what that's going to do is force the air that's trying to collapse the lung out, and as soon as they talk, take a deep breath, hold it, and then seal that over. If you have Vaseline or nothing, you can put Vaseline around it while you're doing that, and that'll help seal it also. If you don't have it, at least like I say, if you have like a Ziploc bag, you can use that in an emergency. You try to overcome with what you have, and if you're out in the woods or you're out somewhere and it happens, you want to be able to do, think of, think of this, well, I just had lunch, I still got my baggie. It's something, but it's better than nothing. So. I've heard them just, you know, in an emergency, you have absolutely nothing. You, know, you pack it literally with your thumbs, pack it full deep, and pack it the whole night. Well, you can use it. As you can to keep the person alive. Sure. You do what you got to do to keep them alive. Yeah, exactly. Sleeve off. You know what I mean? There's always a manual way. Yeah, sure. Sure. Before you have the damn suck laying around sometimes. Yep. Um, go ahead. Gary has his bag, and of course, I've got my little. Especially if you have gauze. I mean, that bag of tricks, too. Yeah, that's all you got. I mean, you can yeah, sure. Uh, and mine's got like that compression bandage. It's got the sling in case somebody breaks an arm or dislocates a shoulder. You're not going to try to read it help them get it back, but what you want to do is you make a sling and you stabilize that so at least the, the collar bone and the shoulder is not grinding against each other. And I, and I got the bandages, two different sizes in there. Uh, so in, in all the, the old Vietnam movies where you see the guys wearing a, the uh, olive drab bandanas, those are, those are the bandages, the triangular bandages that they just use for in something that I don't know if you have in yours, but I've got an emergency burn dressing in mine. That I don't This have. is also good to have because, you know, you never know if you're going to get a burn or what have you. Dick? Just speaking of the bandanas there, uh, I was online looking at uh, some of the prepping stuff, and they have band bandana. It's only like 20 some dollars, I think. And it has on the bandana just different things you can use do that you might need out in the field. Well, that's pretty cool. Did you buy a small one? 
<laughs> That'd be pretty interesting. Question. Yes. Also, to speak to the point that you just made about medications, um, since we know that all of our medications come from China, mm -hmm. there is a website. It's called mygotodoc.com, where they have a preppers kit, and you can request that the doctor on site will give you three months of your medication. If you're oh. having trouble with your doctor to do that, if you're like traveling, they will do that service for you. And then they will also give you um, a book with what different antibiotics are for. And then they'll send you all those antibiotics for if we come into a situation where we can't get them anymore because China has said. Yeah, Sorry. right. So, so it's my, my go to doc.com. They have a prepper option. What's it called? My go to doc dot com. So my go to doc dot com. Okay, cool. Put Thank you. Another thing to carry in your bag is we didn't mention is band aids. Yeah, band aids, ace bandages, band -aid, ace tape, bandage, tape, um, paper tape. You know, works really well, especially if somebody is allergic to the cloth tape, um, and it, it's it holds really well. Oh, yeah, I've got a space blanket in mine also. There you go. Just, uh, actually got two. I think the most important thing that I have in my kit is this pair of bandage scissors. Um, you know, if, if somebody gets a cut or, or, you know, shot or stabbed or whatever, you need to get to that. Instead of trying to tear their clothes off, just cut it. Cut. These things are... They'll, they'll cut through just about anything. They're pretty awesome. What's that? Yeah, cut a penny with them. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're really strong. Okay, other items. I think we covered about everything we have in our bags. Yeah. Than, and as you build your bag, you'll think of different things that you don't have, but you might want to put in. You got to put it in. Yeah, based on different scenarios, too, whether it's, you know, um, a week without power because of a natural disaster or, you know, uh, a collapse of civilization, EMP, where you can't, all the, all the electronics are done, so you can't get anywhere, that kind of thing. You're going to be on your own. Um, so those are all things that you need to think about when you're putting your kit together. Exactly, family members with different health issues, different uh, limitations. Um, mobility. Yeah, mobility issues, uh, back issues. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Just a comment in case yeah. people don't realize. Uh, if somebody is a diabetic, this is all to the first aid court. If they're diabetic and they go down, seizures, whatever, um, you'll, you'll always give them like two packs of pure sugar. Yep. Give it to them no matter what, because it doesn't matter if, it's, if they're going down because their sugar's too high, that little bit of sugar's not going to make that much of a difference. Right. But if it's low, then, then that's what they need. So no matter what the case, they say always give them, give them that. You can give them a soda, but it's not fat, it's fast, you can put sugar under their tongue better still. Right. And don't we have tabs for that, like little tablets that they do? Ice, yeah, they do. Just ice, yeah. Don't they? Yeah. yeah. So that's something, if you know somebody in your family has got diabetes, it's something that you would probably keep in your thing. Yeah, so and different, like we say, different case scenarios have different, you know, absolutely. things that happen. And like Vic says, if you have that, then put a handful of sugar packs in, in your first aid kit. Yep. Ma'am. I have a question. Isn't the Mount Patriots also a health conference? If we could get people maybe to teach people how to reverse some of these diseases and not need these medications? Yeah. We're working on getting somebody to listen next time. Any other questions? What was the name of the website you've got it again? The, the kit? You can get either one through Amazon. Yeah. This um, is called an Everlit, E V E R L I. T. Everlit. Mine just called my medic. Uh, yeah. Either or. Mine has the 
main backpack, and then it's got two front compartments also. With this top one has the band-aids, different size band-aids and stuff. And the lower portion here has... Yeah, if you go on, on Amazon, just type in IFAK, Individual First Aid Kit, it'll bring up all these different kits for you. You're welcome. Another thing I, I mentioned about the, the medications too, uh, aspirin. I'm not 19 anymore. Um, my family, yeah, I know, <laughs> shock. My family has a history of cardiovascular disease, so I always keep a baby aspirin. Yeah. Okay. Um, if Heart someone's pain. having, yes, if someone's having chest pain, chew four baby aspirin right away. That helps to keep it. Usually a clot is what causes the heart attack. And so that keeps any more clot from forming until you can get to a hospital or get some help. And like he said, the best ones are the chewable baby aspirin. Yep. Oh, yummy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, the chewables are, they dissolve quicker in your mouth and yeah. they get into the, the quicker you, Right, the quicker you get them into your system, the better. They also say to use the cayenne, take the cayenne pepper. Well, cayenne pepper heart. also is used not only for blood clot and stopping, it's also so good for the heart. Yeah. Just a little bit on aspirin. <clears throat> I've been seeing some reports where they're actually saying the aspirin is better for you than ibuprofen than the other. Yeah. It's really drink some water before you take it because that was the only big deal, but it was better all around. Right. <clears throat> now, the second part of our little problem. Yeah. Oh. Um, when it comes to uh, you know, small wounds and, or pretty bad cuts and things like that, I didn't hear anything about it, but I wanted to make sure everybody understands that too. Um, I know you've got money, but like direct pressure and elevation right away. Absolutely, yeah. Like yeah, direct pressure, direct pressure elevation, elevation above, above the level of the heart. Um, and, and don't be afraid to press on it so it hurts. Yeah. Um, you're, you're trying to stop them from bleeding. Yeah, and Oh, if the cut is on your leg, well, that's an easy one because you'll have you'll lay them down. Yeah. You'll still have pressure on it, and what you do is just raise the leg up. Okay. Yep. As long as the body is laying flat, you, when you raise the leg up, you're trying to get the, le the uh -huh. here that's bleeding above the heart because the heart's going to pump it to that spot anyhow. Right. But what by holding pressure and elevating a little bit, you're minimizing that. Good question. Any other questions? I got a, actually, right. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, I don't know if the names matter, but so much like when you get an artery cut compared to like just veins or just flesh. That's okay. The thing I would yeah, there is a difference between the heart. There is a difference between the arterial cut and a venous cut. A venous cut is going to be a darker red, and it's going to ooze right. an arterial cut. So if you you get a good one here where I'm cutting to an artery, it's going to come out, it's going to be bright red, and it's going to be spurting because every time your heart's beating, it's throwing it out. That was, yeah. And, yeah, and then, and then also, off, like, if it, there's a cut right, right here, there's that break, your brachial artery, and it's right there, and you stop with your four fingers. But, you know, if the wound's on here, you can know right away in the field whether that's a, a flesh wound, say, Right. Or, or a deadly thing that you're going to have to literally, uh, literally get the uh, Israeli journey on it right away. Right. Same, you know, and then the femoral artery, the same way, I just want to make you know, it's on the inside here. That's why we're training the knife fighting to cut there. But, what, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And then, uh, uh, and the same thing here. Your carotid. That's the most deadly one. You'll bleed out, and what I'm getting at is you'll bleed out way faster than a regular cut. That's what I'm getting at, I guess, is what my point is. Yeah. You'll know. You'll know. I mean, because it's going to be bleeding. Well, you, you're, 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 uh. Heavy, fast, and you're going to be dead in 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, th those veins in your neck are, are pretty thick. Yeah. They're pretty fat. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lar large volume of blood going through there. Sometimes I can, I can 
say to me, like, right, well, you're all right. You just got in the eye. You know? yeah. <laughs> and that's another <laughs> thing, too. Yeah, another thing, and, any cut that any cut that's on, on the scalp or on the, the head or the face is going to bleed a lot, and it's going to be really hard to stop. It, it's, it's, it's just get it in your mind that you're just going to have to hold pressure on there for a while to get it to stop. And you can't put a tourniquet around the neck to stop them. <laughs> Even though there's some people we'd like to. Yeah. I was going to say the same question. Uh, yeah. You had to? Well, here's another thing. I even just thought about it. If you can, get yourself a small vial of super glue. Yeah. yeah. Or you um, use it in surgery. That's, that's what there's we used to sterile. use in the cath lab. So you just leave yeah. the cap on. It's brand new. It's sterile. Yeah. Put it on. Hold, the, hold it together. Make sure you don't get your fingers in it. <laughs> you're part of the person you're trying to yeah. save. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's, now, if you put the like, like if it's an artery, and I mean, it's, it's good for like healing the outside, the skin, you're pulling the skin together. Right. Is that going to work though, like if it's a cut artery? Nope. No. Then no. You just, you got to You've got to put you, a you tourniquet on it. You have to tourniquet an artery yeah. material. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. You, 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 in like triage, you were in the field, something like that happens, you'd be able to know the difference. You know, you guys get out here, you'll be all right. You know, it's the guy that's hitting the femoral, I mean, the brachial artery inside the legs or somewhere under here, you're going to know right away, that's the guy, that's the person we need to help. Can't you get a lighter? <coughs> Some of us always have a lighter. Burn. Yeah. Burn it. Carterize an artery? Not, not an artery. Not an artery. Mm -hmm. artery. That was my question. Yeah. yeah. No, because oh, yeah. your, your artery is a larger vein and it is pumped. Every time your heart is pumping, you're, right. that's, that's why I said it's going, to be, it's going to be a bright, brighter red than, the, than a vein. Because your vein is returning the the, uh, right. the blood back to get oxygenated, and once it comes out, it's going through the artery to, with the oxygenated blood. That's why it's a little bit brighter red, and it's going to be pulsing. It's coming out usually like about almost like you took a gallon jug and just poured it out. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, yeah. Every time the heart beats, you're going to see a spurt. Right, I, I, get, I get that part, but I, did, I wasn't sure that if you could in the field emergency. Yeah. Nothing sure. Around. Yeah. Right. Flesh wounds, you can, yeah. So, an artery. No, that's going to have to be done in, I hate to say it. See, when they're cut, they're going to go like this in the body. They're going to go like that. Right. You're going to have to reach in there and get it. Try to figure out what they're going to do. Yeah, because they, they also retract as well. So basically, what you're saying, uh, if you have to put a tourniquet on here or on your leg, that from there down it's going to lose blood, and you're probably going to lose that now. I've seen arterial bleeds where they, being an EMT, former EMT, um, we're a crash technician also, and when we take the, cut the vehicle apart to get them out and the medics are working on them, they've already had the tourniquet on, they've already yelled at the time, and what they're doing is they're trying to get them to the, from there to the hospital in the golden arrow which goes for heart attacks and strokes also. That golden hour pertains to getting them in to get treated within 60 minutes. And usually if they got, an, like I say, an arterial bleed, what's gonna happen, once that artery is cut, it's like a tendon. It's gonna, it's like a rubber band. If you hold the rubber band and you cut it, what's it gonna do? Yeah, it's like it's the same so, thing. So I remember being told that if you put a tourniquet on, you leave it on for so long, and then you release it, and then you put it back on. Yeah, we did that in the beginning. I, you right. Just that first yeah. part. So, but if you do that, you're really not doing any good because of the artery is far, far apart. It, it's it's really. Not well, that's got to be repaired by the by the surgeon. Yeah. Right. But but what you're do, doing by putting the tourniquet on there is to just keep from bleeding. Out. Keep them from bleeding out. Yeah. Okay. And so if you release that tourniquet. It's really not going to help that limb because it's just going to shoot blood everywhere. And it's just where it needs to get. Well, if, you, if you apply enough pressure on it and hold it just to release it long enough to get blood circulating back in so they don't lose the leg or the arm, you're going to lose a little bit of blood. But the main thing, like you said, is keeping direct pressure on it 
and I don't mean just, I mean pressure. If you have to stand on it, yeah, well basically you're, and then you can release it for a minute and then, then re plant. Yeah, when I worked in the cardiac cath lab, we, we went in through the femoral artery um, and we just used a catheter that was about the size of like a number two pencil lead. And it took us 20 minutes of really pressing down on that after we pulled the catheter out to hold it for it to stop bleeding. So you really have to hold on to it. Um, <laughs> and every once in a while you get a patient that co is coming out of their, their medication and I gotta go, I gotta go. And they start fighting you. You let go and they see that little spurt across the room. Okay, I'll hold still. I'm not going in. Yeah. It gets their attention. Yeah. You have to go to the hospital. There's no For an arterial bleed, yeah. Yeah. Do you suggest anything uh, like liquids? Should they drink, should they not drink, or anything like that if they've got a cut like that? No. Don't drink? What I was, what we were always told in the, as being EMTs and as we practiced what we were doing in the field is that you don't, well, I'm thirsty. I mean, you can't give them anything to drink prior to him going to the hospital because if they have to run him into the surgery, they don't want to have a liquid or whatever in the stomach in case, because they've got to intubate them. Once you go on the surgery, when they, they intubate you is by putting a tube down to help breathe while they have you under sedation. So they don't want anything really in the stomach, so you don't, it's called aspiration, so it doesn't come back up and go back into the lungs because then you end up with pneumonia. And that's another thing you don't want. Yeah. Especially if it, you know you had to drink something prior to going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So basically, we always tell them, "No, we're sorry, we can't give you nothing. That's up to the hospital to decide if you get that." Go ahead. Um, also, when we're talking about the artery thing, you know, a nick on an artery, like somebody gets you a little or something like that, and then a complete cut. So you know, where it pops loose, you know, it's two different things, and they're going to obviously bleed different, um, you know, but when he said something about letting it off every two minutes after two hours or whatever, you know, all that. Yeah, the other thing to remember, too, is you don't have just one artery on each limb, like you've got a radial and an ulnar artery here, and you've got a, a femoral, you've got two femoral arteries on your, on your thigh, and there's three arteries in your lower leg. So even if one of them gets cut, you put the tourniquet on, um, now you release it in two hours, you're still going to get blood flow down that other artery that's not affected. So you're going to get flow to the foot, and then put the tourniquet back on to stop the bleeding from the, the one that was hit. That's a good question. I think we, I think we always used as a rule was one minute. Yeah. What was the question? Uh, the question was is that uh, how long do you take the tourniquet loose to resupply blood, like Gary was saying, to the other artery? And usually the rule of thumb is about a minute. Because what you're trying to do is you're not trying to kill. When you put the tourniquet on, you're stopping all blood flow going down right. that limb. And you don't want to. And the way our heart works is that is it was is it's. We'll get into this in our next section here, but as you're going through, the, the mind's telling it, okay, we have to stop flow to certain bodies to protect the brain and protect the heart. So usually about a minute was rule of thumb over mm -hmm. for a minute. Let some blood go through, reclamp it, and like I said, remark what time. I, and I'm like Gary, we use military time, so if it's. 1935, which is 735 for civilians, and we let it off and we put it back on at 1946 or 48. Keep marking down each time you release that. Time goes on that you put it on, time goes on it when you released it. This way, once they get to the hospital, if it's an hour, two hours, three hours down the road, depending on where you're at, if, you have to, if you're in the woods and you gotta, they have to hike you out or carry you out, it's not going to be as easy as if it happened here where we go out the door and get in our car. So that's pretty much a rule of thumb of that. 
about shock. That's coming. Shock is coming, yes. You want to go through the CPR, start some of the basic CPR? Yeah, or? yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay, here. I was a former CPR instructor, so we will give you a little bit of basics on CPR. You run into a person who is, you see jogging down the road and all of a sudden they collapse. You run up to them and you, got, you shake them and ask them what's wrong. What would be the first thing you would do? Open everybody. Lay it down, check their airway. They're already laying on the ground, they're gasping. See if they're breathing and their heart's beating. Right. 911. 911 is the first thing when you do with that because it's going to take them longer to get the medics and stuff to the person while you're checking the carotid, the radial pulse, brachial pulse. If they don't have a pulse, then you're going to start CPR. I thought you took your wallet first. That's after <laughs> we're done. Yeah. <laughs> that's when, that, that's when we're right. right. And one of the things that, that was str stressed in the last uh, Red Cross class that I took was that nowadays everybody's got these. So when something happens, everybody wants to film it. So you have to say, Cheryl, call 911. Tell some, designate somebody to call 911 and, and then go through your, through your routine. Yeah, if you're, call, if you're by yourself, call 911 first and then, then check the pulse. And don't go by what they do on the, in the movies where they're checking around the back of the head and the side of the neck under the ears. Your carotid pulse is right along the airway in, in here. Is everybody's checking? <laughs> yeah. Or the radial pulse on the thumb side of your wrist. Do what? <laughs> <laughs> so then, then you're going to start your CPR. First thing you're going to do is make sure, you give them a sternum rub to make sure that they're responsive. If they're not responsive, they're having, they had a heart attack and they're stopped. You check, nothing. You want to do is two breaths. Now, if you don't know the person, Obviously, you're not going to do it, but what we carry in our, I carry in my truck is a pocket mask. Absolutely. Now, the pocket mask is also for protection. Now, if it's a loved one or somebody who you know really well and you're not worried about it because you don't want to, again, hurt them, what you're going to do is you don't want the head laying this way or this way. You're going to take the head and you're going to tilt it so the head is back this way. You're opening up their airway. If you're doing it without the mask, you pinch their nose, place your lips over theirs, open their jaw, and give them two. Tip, tilt the head back. Right, so I said tilt the head oh, okay. back. Okay, yeah. And give them two good breaths. Then you're gonna start, you're gonna feel right where the rib cage stops. You don't wanna start CPR there, it's called the xiphoid process. If you start here, you just killed them because you're going to push that right through their liver. You always go from there from where your chest cavity stops. One hand. Of course, it's kind of hard for me because I've got this in the way. Right here at the bottom of my rib cage. One hand. You start up here. You put, take your fingers, interlock them. You come over to them on that, where you found that spot, and don't, like you're doing push-ups, because that's not doing them any good, you're gonna go down, and you're gonna start compressions, and you're gonna push down between an inch and a half and two inches. You are going to break ribs. I'll tell you right now, and if you don't break ribs, you're not you're doing not, it right. You're not going deep enough. And the thing is, is you're gonna do two breaths, and you're gonna do 30 compressions. Thank you. Sir. <laughs> 30, compressions? 30 compressions and then two breaths. They, they, they changed it. It used to be one in 10 and, and then it went to two and 20 and now it's now up to two and 30. Right. 
they're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to give that person between 100 and, and 110 and it was 100 and 115. Yep. It's just uh, one and two and three and four and five and six. And you're 30 times. The whole time. And count out loud. Yeah. yeah. yeah don't be afraid if you got to yell it because you also have somebody else helping you. Now, a two person is very, is, is a little easier because when he hits 30, then the second person is going to go ahead and do the two breaths. And then you're going to go back for your second. Now, you are going to get wore out. Believe me, I've done it many times. Gary has too. You are going to wear yourself out. That's why two people is always best because then you can switch off. Yep. When he gets the two breaths and you take, you release it, he takes over and you're doing the two breaths. So it's something to keep in mind that it's not an easy task. Now, once the paramedics show up, what they have is they've got a new machine now. And yeah, seen it. yeah, that's pretty cool. And they, they hook it up <clears> and it already <throat> does the chest compressions. And it's like, usually, the one thing I didn't think is that we are covered under the Good Sam Law. Good Samaritan Law. Good Samaritan Law, yep. What that does is, this way, you're helping that person. He can't come back and sue you. For breaking his ribs. For breaking his ribs. Yeah. I mean, because like I say, if you're doing chest compressions and you're doing them right, you're going to break ribs. Yeah. Unless they have a DNR in their chest. See, we, see well, you're not allowed to, you're yeah. not allowed as a that's, consumer. As that's a, a good point. We're not allowed to ask. Really? Oh, because you're not medical doctors. Right. Well, they should have a tattoo. <laughs> well, you also check in our arms to see if they have any medical bracelets. Right. You know, that tells you, you know, I'm a heart patient or I have COPD. Um, no, I mean, I'm just being a smart aleck. I don't mean to no, be, but, no. it's, but this society is so offended. Absolutely. That's a, so that's a good point. Yeah. They're going to sue you. They're going to turn around and sue you. For what? God forbid. See you later. Yeah, one other thing, too. One other thing, when, when you're giving the, the, the two breasts, Kind of breathe and watch their chest. Make sure it goes up and down, um, so you know that their air, airway's not obstructed, and that you are doing effective breaths. So they are you are filling their lungs with air. Now, if you do your first breath and you see the stomach go up, stop, readjust the head, bring it forward, and then bring it back again and try. If you see the chest come up, then you know you're putting air into the lungs and not into the stomach. Because wow. by tilting your head back, because what you're doing is you're closing off the little flap for the stomach, and you're pushing air into the, into the lungs. Now we do have a CPR dummy up here. Go ahead. If you want to, you guys want to practice. Check your blood pressure. Yeah. Okay. Um, Start exercise and get in shape. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that can always always help. But check your blood pressure is a big one. Learn about blood pressure and 
Know your family history is a big one. You're going to make me want Mexican food now. doesn't matter. This is the mannequin. Okay. What I was talking about earlier is this is the bottom of the rib cage. Show your rib cage. This is where they call the xiphoid process. This is the part that you do not want to do compressions near. Because like I said, you will push that through the liver and then prevent compressions if you already wiped it out. Rule of thumb is one fist, usually right between the nipple line. This is where you're going to start the compressions. Tilt the head back. Two breaths. With the mask, you don't need to cover the nose. What you make sure is when you hold the mask on. Okay, I don't Once you're blowing in, it's going to go in, it's not going to come back out. And what you want to do is once you put it over the face, you want to take your hand and grasp it like that. Press over and make sure you got a seal because it's this is kind of soft. Tilt the head back, two breaths. You'll see the chest rise. Then you're going to come over and you're going to start your compressions. And like I say, you want to start your compressions, you don't want to, you are going to be, that was ribs breaking. And you're going to push down that hard. Like I say, you heard the, you heard the crack, that was the ribs breaking, that was the initial one. You're breaking ribs. So it usually happens right away? Right, right in, usually right within the first one or two pushes. Yeah. You will hear them snapping and don't let, you have to let that. Don't get squeamish. Yeah. 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 Remember, you're, you're trying to save this person's life. They can get over broken ribs. Yeah, it takes them a little bit, but they can get over. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Exactly. You're not going to get over being dead, right? Don't get dead. Don't get dead. Like I said, you're... Have them laying down on a flat surface. You have both hands over. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, to 30. Two breaths. Start again. Two breaths, then 30. Two breaths. Two, yep. Two full breaths. Two of your breaths. Inhale through the mask. Tilt the head back. And start again. Now, what if you do it the first the first set of thirty, and, and they start their heart starts beating or they start breathing? Well, that's after you first group. You're going to do three sessions of thirty, and then you're going to check check your carotid, check your radial, your brachial. Just make sure you check to see if you feel a slight pulse. Put your ear down. And listen to see if they're breathing. Now, if the heart starts slowly and you get a pulse, but they're not breathing, then you're going to go into what's called rescue breathing. Instead of doing the CPR, you're going to give them 
two breaths and let them catch up. Mm -hmm. If somebody drowns, they can, their heart can still be beating, but they're not breathing, correct? Well, the first thing, when the, well, that goes in, that's a different thing when they're drowning. The first thing you're going to do is get them on land. You're going to roll them on their side, and you're going to get them to get the, try to get the fluid out of their lungs because you can't push air through water. Does anybody want to try? Don't be shy. You're not going to hurt him. He's already there. Already Last time I checked. <laughs> Nobody's home. That's that's why I was you thinking can go right about here, the, oh I can do it right here yeah. okay yeah, yeah. okay so I'm on that spot what you're gonna do is you're gonna look between the nipple line okay put that in there in it yep in there, in there. okay yeah, that is hard <laughs> okay I tried it yeah. <laughs> and like I say that's going to be 30 times yeah. right and remember not to bend your elbows lock your elbows in. Okay. What basic yeah. line is, is if, if, if you don't, don't want to load it, is try to find right between the nipples. Mm -hmm. You put that hand, and then you're going to push down. There goes that straight away. That's far, not far enough. That's when you enough. hear that click. You got to hear that click. That's how far you got to go down. Did you talk about 30? Anybody need an arm workout? That's, that's why you don't. Flex your elbows because once the triceps go, you're done. You're done. Yeah. Anybody that's lifted weights knows that if, when you're yeah. li doing tricep work, once it goes, it goes. Yeah, it's. You want to do the whole scenario? No. I'm a nurse. Oh, cool. <laughs> sure, go for the whole scenario. Okay. So you're going to come up to the person. Annie, are you okay? <laughs> they don't answer. So you're going to listen. <laughs> Nothing. So. It's been years. Oh, you call 911, you grab the AED. There you go. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight, nine and ten and eleven and twelve, thirteen and fourteen and fifteen and sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-nine, thirty. Two breaths. Then you go again. <laughs> Why not? Remember to have somebody call 911. That's the biggest thing. You get there and you get so clustered. These are not that expensive. No, yeah, no they're really not. Yeah. Um, what is that called? The, the it's, a pocket, it's, a mask. it's called the pocket mask. Pocket mask. Exactly. Uh, some of them come in a hard case. Gary has his in the. In the, in the CPR, CPR mask. You can reuse it, right? Just sanitize them? Right. Yeah. Well, these are one way valves, so you can throw these away and you can replace these. This also has a filter inside of it. Yeah. And it has a, a filter. filter. So, what you're doing is you're protecting yourself. Now, if somebody, if we're here in a church and somebody, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to do CPR. I'm not worried about a mask. But if it's a stranger, you don't know their environment or where they've been or what have you. Then you're going to use this, and it, and they, they made it really dummy proof. It says nose, <laughs> and has an arrow. Yeah, that, that's a good point. You're stressed out. Yeah. Yeah, true, true. April, you said lock your elbows. Oh, yeah. that's all. Don't worry about that. Okay. Lock your elbows. You don't want to let your elbows. Yep. And remember, he's going to be on the floor. I'm afraid I'd hit that spot that you said that was not safe. As long as you're between the nipple line, then you're male good. or female, yep, you're good. Right. it's not going to matter. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. There you go. When you hear that click, you're far enough. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and then, like, um, I, like I said, what you're going to do is the mask is going to be, you, I keep this in my truck. Yeah. This is my personal mask. You're going to put it on. You're going to be, obviously you're going to be here. You take your hand like this and it's, and don't matter if they have a beard or not. 
That's another good point. If a gentleman has a beard, don't worry about it. This will seal <coughs> enough to get at least two breaths into them. Place your hand like that, press down, tilt the head back, poof, poof. Do you take that off after the breaths? So maybe they could try to breathe? I don't know. Well, you, yeah, you, you use the two breaths and then take this off. Oh, okay. And, and your hand's gonna be off of it yeah. because you're holding it down to seal it. Then your hand's gonna be <laughs> otherwise occupied. Oh, okay. Yeah, because if you're doing one person CPR, you're gonna be like, oh, who's my right. oh, God. God. <laughs> Anybody else wanna try? Yeah, Becky wants to try. Go, Becky, go, Becky. Now, I have done it where I've had some of our work, thank you. I'm not a novice. Look at her, she's panicking. Don't do this to me. I want to do it from her. <laughs> you guys ever heard the song Staying Alive by the Bee Gees? Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. Staying alive. We're trying to keep them alive. We're staying alive. That's the rhythm you want to do this at. Yep. A lot of people don't do enough reps in the 30 reps. So when you go to do it, you want to do that. Uh, 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 staying alive. Staying alive. Uh, 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 stay. That's the timing you want, but that's to get you going. So you keep that rhythm going and count. But or Bob will be on the side singing. Right, and also too, when, <laughs> when you're doing this, they're not elevated above you. You usually have your, you're on your knees. Yes. Your weight is above them, so you will have your More body power. weight <laughs> in your favor going down. Yeah. So you are locking your arms, not pushing with your muscles. You're using your weight. 